the shadow knows. <laughs> Your local blue coal dealer presents The Shadow. These half-hour dramatizations are designed to forcibly demonstrate to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Before this afternoon's adventure with The Shadow begins, here is advice every homeowner will profit by following. When you order your next supply of fuel, ask for blue coal. Then you'll enjoy steady, dependable heating comfort and satisfaction such as you've never known before. Countless thousands of American families have found from experience what a tremendous difference blue coal makes. It burns down to a fine ash, leaving no wasted, unburned coal. And it gives steadier, healthier heat with less furnace attention. So if you want the solid fuel for solid comfort, insist on blue coal by name. Call your dealer for your supply tomorrow. The shadow, mysterious character who aids those in distress and helps the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice belongs. The only one who knows the true identity of that master of other people's minds, the Shadow. Today's story, Valley of the Living Dead. This desert scenery is simply magnificent, Lamont. Why, this alone was worth the trip. Yes. And I think that's the mountain range over there that I've been looking for. Sort of saw teeth edge to it. Looking for a mountain range? The whole thing seems silly to me. Long trip just because you heard of a rumor that there's a valley someplace behind a sawtooth mountain where people act peculiarly. <laughs> What's behind this rumor? That's just what I'm going to find out, Margot. Yes? Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I want some gas. Huh? And I also want to know the best road up that mountain over there. Ah, oh, there ain't no road over that mountain you can drive on, mister. No road? Well, what's the matter with that one right ahead there? That's no good. It's dangerous. And you see, uh, ain't many folks besides me who's been in that valley. And, brother, I'm going to live there someday. Well, if you go, you can go alone, Timothy Hicks. I'll have plenty of time to rot when I'm dead and in my grave. What's that you said? I said I'd have long enough to rot when I'm in my grave. Ah, don't pay no attention to the missus. She don't know nothing. Why, on the other side of that there range, they got the slickest place you ever seen. Put it in a round valley. There's only one thing, though. I've got to be busted to live there. You can't have any money? Yep, busted. Why, the folks in there get the houses given to them and food, everything. You mean a sort of a state poor farm? Nope, nothing like that. It's private. Owned by Mr. Maxim. Kindest man that ever was. Yes, indeed. Well, there you are, mister. All fixed up. Uh, about how many people live in that valley? Well, well, I wouldn't know exactly. There's maybe eight, nine hundred. I ain't been in since they prospected for gold. <laughs> Boy, they sure hit a vein. Well, then they must have plenty of money in there. Nope, they ain't. See, while Mr. Maxim was in the east, those folks got some capital in from the outside to work the mine. Yep, but uh, but then they uh, he came back. Maxim come back too soon. Gosh, was he mad. Put a stop to it as quick as cat. Gold, and he put a stop to it? Yep, yeah, he ain't supposed to have no money in there. Yeah, probably can't tell a nickel from a dime, but now... Me, I can't see myself without a bit of change in my hand now, man. Not me. Ain't got nothing in there I want. No radios, theaters, stores, nothing. Well, Lamont Cranston, there's certainly no great wrong here to write. I suggest we give up the whole thing and make this a pleasure trip for a change. Sorry, Margo. Here you are, Hicks. Oh, thanks, mister. Uh, hey, mister, be on the, on the watch for gold that's rolling across the road there. Well, here's where we leave the paved road and start climbing. There's a sign. Danger, drive up this road at your own risk. Oh, yes, I see it. And I assure you it interests me, Margo. In view of what our friend back there just warned us. Uh, there comes the bolder now, Lamont. Bigger than this car. You're right. Oh. Well, strange. 
Hmm, missed us anyhow. Now will you turn back? The road isn't safe. Well, that one might be just coincidence, Margot. It's a fine road. Nothing wrong with it. Good all the way up, far as I can see. There's another boulder. Yes, coming right down this path. Yeah. Hold fast. Oh, thank goodness that missed us too. Lamont, there's no coincidence about those boulders rolling down. No, you're right, Margot. Unless I'm mistaken, it's an electric eye. And it starts them as surely as it would open a door. Well, then, for pity's sake, let's get out of here. We'll be smashed to bits. I've had enough of this whole thing. Before the sun sets, Margot, we're going to be in that valley. But we're going in by plane. But it all seems so unnecessary, Lamont. Going and getting this plane, there can't be anything wrong. Not with this man Maxim on the job. Say he's so kind and all that. Margot, never in my life have I felt a more compelling certainty that something was wrong. At any rate, we'll know the moment we're over the jagged teeth of this ridge below. There. Look, Margot. There's the valley. I'll fly lower. Look closely. The marks, this is low enough. Yes, a hundred feet. And look. Look at those people closely, Margot. They move along the streets. The lifelessness of them. Well, no traffic to keep them jumping. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong. Children half-heartedly at play. No work being done anywhere. Men sprawled on the grass. Well, what of it, Lamont? Cut off from the outside world. No work to do. No amusements. Nothing for mind or muscle to feed on. By Margot, that place is like a stagnant pool covered with green slime. Beautiful to look at, but filled with decay. Well, maybe you're right, Lamont. Even the women don't stop to talk to one another. They don't even look up at the sound of the plane. And over there, just beyond the dam, are the gold mines. Latest equipment lying idle. And a chance for everybody to make a lot of money. Look, what's that back against the hill? Oh, it's a sort of castle. Now, wait a minute, Margot. That standard flying from the turret there. It has a name on it. I'll try to get closer and make it out. See, uh... Ingram A. Maxim. Ingram Maxim. Why, I know who this fellow is now. You do? In college. I was just a freshman. He was taking postgraduate. A bald, thin little man, always helping some of the fellows. Why, he was rich as Croesus even then. Hang on, Margot. I'm going to set her down on the other side of the dam. Find out what this is all about. Why don't they answer, Lamont? We'll keep on knocking until they do. Wait. I saw the curtain move from the window up there. Please, Lamont, let's go back to the plane. I I feel weak. What was that? I don't know. It's horrible. But, Margot. Good heavens, Margot. Here, you're not fainting. Oh, the lady has fainted. (laughs) Mr. Maxim, please. I prefer to carry her. I will carry her. No one here dictates to Maxim. There. Now, precede me into the house, if you will, sir. And now, with the little lady well taken care of, we shall dine together. Cranston, we talk over the old days. You see, I remember you indeed. I, I have the faculty of remembering everybody I ever see. I couldn't forget you, naturally. Always doing such kind things to help the less fortunate chaps at college? <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all. Now, here, of course, I have much larger opportunities. Yes, undoubtedly. Um, something's been puzzling me, Maxim. Those boulders rolling down into the road. I'm curious to know how you work that. I have my own ways, Mr. Cranston, of protecting this valley of mine from intruders. I want nothing from the outside world to touch my people. Nothing. Uh, well, Smother, I can't move. You're all right, Margot. I... I'm right here. Keep your arms under the blankets, little lady. That's it. But I, I'm not cold. I'm smothering. Too much exertion, my dear, coming down that steep path from the dam. Women's delicate bodies were not built for harsh exertion. You see, they... Serena, what are you doing here? Why did you leave your room in your wheelchair without my help? Is the lady sick, Maxim? Are you sick too, my dear? No. 
No, nothing wrong with me. Just a little chill. Uh, Miss Lane, uh, my wife. How do you do? Mr. Cranston. How do you do? Did you uh, suffer an injury of some sort, Mrs. Maxim? That you should have to be in a wheelchair? No. Oh, no. I've always been strong. But after the birth of my son, I... Yes, I... I think that was when oh, My I... dear, you are exerting yourself too much. You must go to your room. But Maxim's always taken such good care of me. I never have to lift a hand. He carries me, puts me in my bed. He feeds me. He's always so kind. Kind. It is the privilege of all strong people, my dear, to take care of the weaker. Oh. Uh, come, my dear Serena. Off to bed with you. Maxim, the lady heard it too. It's not my imagination. It's the wind, my dear, in a faulty flu. I shall have it fixed tomorrow. Oh, I tell you, it has the sound of my son's voice. <laughs> now, now, that imagination of yours again, my dear. We know that Paul is off at school. Now, say good night to Miss Lane and Mr. Clancy. Good night, Miss Lane. Mr. Clancy. Good night. <laughs> While we're waiting for the second act of The Valley of the Living Dead, here's a word to the wise. Homeowners, when you order fuel, keep in mind that there's just as much of a difference between the quality of various kinds of hard coal as there is in an automobile, radio, or washing machine. This difference lies in the location of the fields from which the coal comes and the care in mining and preparation. That's why it will pay you to insist on blue coal when you order your next supply of fuel. For Blue Coal is a guaranteed product of the nation's largest hard coal producer, the Glen Alden Coal Company. Their mines are located in the richest part of the northern Pennsylvania anthracite field. Each ton of Blue Coal as it comes from the mines is screened and re-screened many times for perfect sizing. Then it's washed to remove any existing impurities and laboratory tested by trained inspectors. Only the coal which passes this thorough laboratory test and meet Glen Alden's high quality is shipped to Blue Coal dealers. That's why you can be sure of perfect heating comfort and satisfaction when you order quality-tested Blue Coal by name. You'll find that Blue Coal gives you steadier, more dependable heat. So call your nearest Blue Coal dealer tomorrow. His name is listed in the Where to Buy It section of your classified telephone directory under the words Blue Coal. You'd never come. But, Paul, my son, don't I always come? Oh, Miss Spielcast, can't we take it off? Not yet, my boy. <laughs> to remove it too soon would mean that you'd never walk again. I don't care. I don't care. It's, it's now. It's the pain now that I can't stand. I know what is best for you, Paul. But it's getting worse. I can't rest. I can't sleep. Come now. You must. Oh, I only could and never wake up. Uh, that is better. Uh, Patience. Uh, Patience. I'll turn the light low. Uh, there. Good night, my son. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> I'm glad he's gone. I'll get that cast off somehow. <laughs> Even if it does cripple me. I don't care. Let me help you, Paul. Who spoke? Where are you? Don't be frightened. I've come to help you. Nothing can frighten me anymore. But I can't see you. I can sometimes help people better because I'm not seen. Oh, I don't know what you mean, but, but can you really help me? I mean, take the cast off. Yes, Paul, right away. Tell me, how long have you had it on? Nearly two years. I was away at school and had an accident. My father came to see me. Well, well, I don't remember much about that part. But a doctor said that I would have to have this cast put on. A doctor said that? Well, well yes. My father told me he did. Yeah. yeah, trust me now. I want you to try to stand. But I can. My father says I can. I want you to try. All right. I'll try. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I'm standing. Good boy. That's what I wanted to know. You have two strong, healthy legs. They're growing against steel that clamps them like a vice. This cast is coming right off. It's off. Oh, but my legs, they feel numb. Steady, Paul. The pain will soon be gone. You'll be well again. Well again, boy. Oh, yours is not the only bondage to be broken tonight. Ah, Margot, it's good to get out in the air. Get down these stone steps. Watch out. I'm steep. Lamont, tell me that dreadful cry. Was that... Yes, his son, Margot. I was able to relieve his suffering, so... Oh, thank heaven for that. But down in the village, all those people, what can you do for them? Their suffering has been great enough. I'll make them help themselves. Oh, watch out. This last step. Yeah, that's it. There isn't a light anywhere. Everyone in this village is asleep. That's it, Margot. Everyone has been asleep too long. But with luck... I hope to awaken their minds to this, this living death. Not a sound anywhere, Lamont. Except that coyote off in the hills. The villagers sleep, Marjorie. But they do not rest. Come, I'll show you how their tortured subconscious minds react. This place of living dead. This silence beats on my ears like the drums of eternity. And in the next house and the next, Margot, I must go to them as they sleep in the shadows. Try to free them from this bondage of submission. The bells. I hear them. A good, honest roar of machinery. The white heat of the furnaces. There's a fine strength in me. And I'm to have a raise of a dollar at the end of the week. Ah, no. No, that's past and gone. I become as soft as something that lies rotting in the sun. There is no hope. I am dead. Dead. No. No, my friend, you're alive. And you can be strong again. What? Who spoke? Who said that? God put muscles in a man's body for use, for work. Work? Yes, work. Uh, But we are dead. Not while there is work to be done, and you can do it. I've dreamed that dream until I'm nearly mad. Then go to the mines. They wait only for your courage to start them working. No. No, we can't do that. Mr. Maxim has forbidden it. Wake up, man. He has given you what only money can buy. He has taken from you what only God can give. Your freedom. Start working the mines tonight. 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 Lamont, there are lights now in every house. Yes. And over there, lanterns swinging to the quick step of men hurrying to the mines. Give me your hand, Margo. We've no time to lose. We're almost at Maxim's castle. You think in a single night you will have destroyed Maxim's self-created world. As well as that, Margot, everything on which his ego has fattened. Listen, the people are wasting no time. Hurry. Here, I'll help you. Up these steps. Quickly. Quickly, Margot, quickly. This is Maxim's room, Margot. You stay back. I don't know what danger lies behind this door. But as the shadow, I'll soon find out. After all I've done for them... They betray my generosity. Men and women alike. They're crowded down at the mines of the hundreds. I'm going out to the balcony to observe them more clearly. Maxim, what's happened? Why are you so angry? Mrs. Maxim, oh, I... don't be startled. I'm here to help you. Listen closely. This is a fight for freedom. Oh, who speaks? It's, it's all such a strange dream. Do as I tell you without questioning. Rise out of your bed, out of your weakness, and fight as those people down at the mines are starting to fight. But I... I can't rise. I can't walk. Not without Maxim's help. You can. You shall. You've got to fight out of the weakness to strength and freedom. Yes. Yes. Fight out of weakness to... to strength and freedom. I can. I will stand. I see their game. They want a freedom apart from me. But they shan't have it. 
I stopped them before. I'll stop them again. No, Madison. Don't stop them this time. Don't. Serena, you... You standing alone. How dare you stand alone without my help? I'd rather die, Madison. Standing alone as God intended me to stand than go on in a living death of the weakness that comes of your constant support. You two, after all I've done, devoted my life to you. What madness is in this place tonight? Madness is lifting from this place tonight, Maxim. What? Uh, what is that voice? Who speaks? Perhaps it is your conscience speaking, Maxim. Your conscience. Serena, what is that voice? Do you hear it? Or is this whole thing some crazy dream? I only know that I can stand alone and move alone. And if it's a dream, I hope I never wake. Listen closely, Maxim. Your conscience speaks again. You gave these poor creatures the things your millions could so easily buy. You felt great and noble and princely in the giving. And for that, you robbed them of their strength of will and muscle and heart. It is a crime. Just as stealing money is a crime. This is how they repay me, is it? They hurl my liberality back into my teeth and make it a reproach. Maxim, you are consumed by selfishness. A selfishness so great that it has sacrificed a thousand people and your, your wife and your son to its greedy demand. It's a lie! My whole life has been devoted to others. My people know I love them. I'll go to them. I, I'll talk to them. Will you also listen to them? They will listen to me. And I will give them their choice of life or death. Accept life as I have given it to you, then you shall have death as I give it to you. I shall save them from themselves. A quick, merciful death. Yes, one turn of this lever, and in a few minutes the valley will be a deep and silent lake. Yes, one turn of this lever. For the second time, Maxim, your conscience speaks. Let it speak. I know what is best for my people. You can nothing about those people. How wrong you are, voice. I care enough about them to exterminate them all rather than submit them to the corruption of an outside world. Just one turn of this handle. Just one turn of that handle and you would be a murderer. The ungrateful have no right to live. Close those gates before it is too late. You have no right to pronounce death for if there's a guilty man in this valley today, you are that man. I, I guilty. Of oh, what am I guilty? You attempted to buy the freedom of a thousand people, Maxim. To force them to the knees before you. And to keep them there for the rest of their lives. No! No, no, I... Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Just leave it. Oh, I must turn it back. The rush of water against the gate is too strong. I can't turn it. Maxim, I'm here. Cranston. Lamont Cranston. Here beside you. Oh, Cranston, I'll help you. Before it's too late. Yes, together. Our combined strength. Help. Oh, they shall live. Maxim, what's wrong? There's blood on your lip. Oh. Something in me is broken. The weight of closing the gate. Yeah, lean on me. Wait. Look, oh, Cranston, look. Coming there. Walking toward me. Look. Walking. My wife and my son. Yes, walking. Here, Maxim, take my arm. No, Cranston, I am dying. I gave my life closing those gates, saving my people. Tell them that. Tell my wife and son. Please lean on me. Let me help you to your feet. No, no, look. The weaker I grow, 
the more strongly they walk. My wife and son, they are getting back what I took away. You're a great man at this moment, Maxim. And listen, down by the mines as the water recedes, they're cheering you, Maxim. Yes, yes I, I hear them cheering me. And they are the cheers of a living and a free people. Before you hear a preview of next week's shadow story, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal's heating expert, with more of his time and trouble-saving hints on furnace care and attention. Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and good afternoon, friends. A great many homeowners are under the impression that they can save money by putting only a little coal on the furnace. On the contrary, that's one of the surest ways I know to actually waste money. A flimsy, shallow fire is apt to go out. It won't give you enough heat. And it causes constant trips to the cellar to refuel the fire. The economical way to fire your furnace is to keep a deep fire bed at all times. Build the fire up to the level of the bottom of the fire door. Of course, in milder weather, you can leave a little heavier layer of ash on the grates. This keeps the fire burning slowly, yet it keeps enough coal burning to give plenty of heat if the temperature should suddenly drop. And remember... If you feel your furnace isn't giving you 100% heating results, here's what you do. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer. Ask him to send a John Barclay serviceman to look over your furnace. These men are trained heating experts. They're fully qualified to locate the source of any possible furnace trouble and show you how it can be corrected. This John Barclay service is yours without any charge or obligation of any sort on your part. So always feel free to call your blue coal dealer. I thank you. And now for a preview of next week's exciting shadow adventure entitled Prelude to Terror. The eminent scientist, Professor Baker, is sitting in his study late one night when there is a knock on the door. Thinking it is his butler, Cooper, he says... Hey, come in, Cooper. Oh, I thought it was Cooper. Shut Thank up, you. Professor Baker. I got a present for you. Oh. Uh, here's what the boss wants. And before he's through, the people of this city will wish they were dead like you, Professor Baker. Why did this man kill Professor Baker? For what reason does he say an entire city will welcome death? Be sure to find out next week when you hear The Shadow's newest adventure, Prelude to Terror. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is now on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen, and be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the shadow belongs. Today's story, Prelude to Terror. Oh, 
Cooper. Yeah, Professor Baker. I thought you'd like this cup of hot tea. Oh, yes, yes, thanks. Helps to keep me awake. And I have a lot of work to do tonight. Shall I pour it, sir? Yes, please. Well, isn't this your night off, Cooper? Yes, sir. I passed the house on my way home and saw your lights on. I, I know how you enjoy a late cup of tea. Very considerate of you, Cooper. Very. But it's late, and you must get your rest. Oh, the doorbell. Hmm. I wonder who that could be at this hour of night. Shall I answer it, sir? Yes, Cooper, yes. I'll take care of the tea. All right, all right. Amy, what are you doing here? Cut the gab. Close the door. I know. Braden sent you. Where's old man Baker? Upstairs in his study. Okay. Hey, wait. I won't let you do this. I won't let you hide it. You keep your mouth shut unless you want to go back and finish out that prison turn you ran out of. Hey, leave Professor Baker alone. Please. I'm not going to be in on this. I'm getting out. Well, who was the late co... Oh. I... I thought it was Cooper. What do you... Oh. Short jumpy tonight, Braden. What you what are you walking up and down like that for? Something on your mind? Yeah. Big things. Things you'd never understand. I wonder what's keeping Heaney. Should have been here half an hour ago. Think he might have muffed things, boss? I hope not. There he is now. Open up. Okay, boss. We was just talking about you. Yeah, well, Heaney, what happened? You have any trouble? Ah, uh, not much. I just put two slugs into the old guy, Professor Baker. He's dead. The rest was easy. What about Cooper? Uh, he was scared stiff. He let out. You let him get away? Yeah, you don't have to worry about that guy. He's too scared to talk. You should have put the silencer on him anyway. Well, and you're the boss, Braden. What do you want me to do? Take no chances. Dig Cooper up and close his trap for keeps. Okay, boss. I'll take care of him. You get the stuff I sent you after? Yeah, sure did. Let me have it. And yeah, let's see. Hey, get it right inside here. Yep. Here you are, boss. The old professor had it right where you said. Yeah. This is it, all right. What is it, Braden? Looks like an empty bottle to me. It's a colorless, odorless gas. The most powerful explosive in existence. Enough to blow up this whole city. Huh? This is all there is in the world. Yeah? What are you going to do with it? You'll find out. Hey, Yang and Stahl. Yes, boss? What's on your mind? You used to be a chemist, right? Still I am. The best outside the wall. All right, I want you to take this cash out of this little bottle and seal it in that crate of light bulbs I got last night. Think you can do it? I guess so. How much cash to the vault? Wait, I'll help you. Morgan, Grace, all of you, come here. What's up, Grace? Plenty. <laughs> when we get these explosive light bulbs fixed up, I want you to go out and plant them in light sockets everywhere. In stores, houses, public buildings all over the city. Well, what's the big idea, Braden? I'm going to plunge the city into total darkness for one night. Total darkness? How are you going to make them dance their light? Look, we get these bulbs planted before noon tomorrow. When it gets dark, they'll turn on lights. And some of these places will be blown to bits. Oh, boy. The next night, they won't dare turn on a light. Yeah? Where do we come in? What does that get us? What does it get us, you sap? Don't you see... When the city blacks out, we move in and take over. Wow. Yeah. I've drawn up a chart showing exactly where the explosive bulbs are to be planted. You ain't missed a trick, huh, Brady? This is a big job. Now we'll need plenty of help for the cleanup. Round up every dip, rod man, gangster, any crook you know. Have them here in the mill tomorrow night. Okay, boy. Don't worry, boy. As soon as everything's set, we'll move in under cover of darkness. It's a poor cut. They will be helpless. Yeah. <laughs> we'll rob, steal, pillage to our heart's content. We'll take everything that's not nailed down. Boy, what a stunt. Well, that's a crook's paradise. Greatest idea I've ever heard. It's the greatest idea in the history of crime. I'm going to create a reign of terror like this country has never known. <laughs> Yes, I don't exactly know what I want. Well, is it a uh, boy or a girl? A girl. I'm her grandmother. Oh, is that so? Well, I have a little girl, too. How old is your granddaughter? Uh, she's just four months old. 
Oh, well, then you must see our modern nursery. The infant's things are all in there. Mm-hmm. Do you come right this way, please? Oh, I'd like something this way. Hand back. Are you step right in? Thank you. Oh, it's rather dark, isn't it? Well, I'll put on more light. It switches. Ah, here we are. volunteer you can find as a special deputy. I'll broadcast an appeal to all doctors and nurses in this entire territory to report there at once. Stay right on the job, Rofi. Phone me again in ten minutes. Okay, Commissioner West. Goodbye. The Lord Cranston to see you, Commissioner. Cranston? Well, you tell him for me. Oh, Commissioner Weston, why don't you tell me yourself? I'm busy, Cranston. What do you want? I came to see if there's anything I can do to help in this horrible catastrophe. If you can swing a pick, drag a hose, or carry a stretcher, there's plenty for you to do. I've already done my bit in that direction. For the moment, I'm interested in the reason for these awful crimes. Now, wait a minute, Cranston. I've got more on my mind than just sitting here and satisfying your curiosity. This is not just curiosity, Commissioner. I've got a theory. So has everybody else. I've got no time for crackpot theories. You certainly are flattering, Commissioner. Well, I'm not running a school for amateur detectives. No, I'd never suspect you of pedagogic inclinations, Commissioner. But tell me, do you know how the explosions occurred last night? No, I don't. All I know is that the two places went up when the lights went on. Then I'm sure I can help you. If you have any evidence, any facts, I'm willing to listen. But I don't want to hear any more theories. But all right, Commissioner. Calm yourself and I'll explain. I am calm. Oh, yes, of course you are. Now, my theory is this. What? Oh, all right, let's put it this way. My hunch is this. Go ahead. Get it off your chest and let me get back to work. You want to clear up the mystery of these explosions, don't you, Commissioner? That, Cranston, would seem to be the general idea. Then you must first find out who killed Professor Baker. Are you trying to tell me that there's a connection between the death of Baker and these explosions? I'm not just trying, I'm telling you. There is, definitely. What makes you so sure about it? I happen to know that Professor Baker was experimenting with an explosive, such as might have been used in these two blasts. Where does your theory go from there? Professor Baker was killed for possession of that explosive. Find his killers... And you found the men responsible for the other crimes. But where's the motive? What reason could they have had for blowing up those places and killing all those people? That I don't know. There you are, in a blind alley. You have a theory and nothing to support it. Now run along, Cranston. My nerves won't stand any more of this month. You must listen to me, Commissioner. You've got... Now I've got... Hello? Hello, Commissioner Weston. Yes, who's this? Never mind that. I got some dope for you. What do you mean? Those two explosions last night were bad, huh? Well, that's only a little sample of what's coming tonight. What? What did you say? You heard me. You're going to have a worse mess on your hands if you don't carry out my orders. Orders? I want this city in total darkness tonight. Total darkness? If there's an electric light, auto headlamp, or even a flashlight turned on, you're going to get a bouquet of explosions worse than yesterday. You must be stark mad. You'll never get away with this. Try me and see. Either the lights go out 
before the city goes up. Hello. Hello, hello. Cranston, did you hear that? Yes, I did, Commissioner. What are we going to do? It'll be dark in a few hours. Commissioner, that man must be stopped. If he's not, this city will be the scene of indescribable horror tonight. We've got to stop him. Threaten more blasts. Mystery voice wants Commissioner West. Explosive electric lamps spread through city. Read all about it. Terrible. We won't have any light. How are we going to see in the dark? Please, tonight. Me neither. That one might travel.
That's the last candle I have in the house, Mr. Cooper. They're very scarce now. But at least you'll be able to finish your packing. Uh, thanks, Mrs. Kelly. Oh, my, no. I'm not sorry to see you go. But I don't blame anybody for getting out of this cursed city, that yeah. I don't. Yeah, sure. Now, uh, if you don't mind, i got a lot of packing to do. Good oh. night, Mrs. Kelly. Well, it, if that's the way you feel, uh, goodbye and good riddance to you, Mr. Cooper. I can't see you. I'm the Shadow, Cooper. The Shadow? You know of me, don't you? Now listen, Cooper. I've got to talk fast, and so do you. i got nothing to talk about. Cooper, you share responsibility for the death and destruction in this city. No, that's a lie. I, I had nothing to do with it. You know the man who killed Professor Baker. You've got to tell me who he is. I can, I can. You must. You alone can release the city from the grip of terror that man has placed it in. I don't know anything about it, I tell You're you. You're lying, Cooper. I know. You opened the door for the killer. I... I wouldn't hurt the old man. You were with him just before he died. But I had nothing to do with his death. Honest, I didn't. If you want to save yourself and clear your conscience, you've got to talk. But I... All right. All right, I want to get it off my mind. I'll talk. I'll talk. Heaney. Heaney, what do you want? Just a living little message from the boss, Cooper. Here it is. Right here in the room with us. 
He's got some trick so we can't see him. But that don't mean we can't get him. Grace. Yeah? Stand by that door. Okay. Keep your back against it and don't let anybody or anything open it. Now, Morgan, yeah. pick up that machine gun and spray the other end of the room. But he's out the light. Hey, I'm getting out of here. Hey. All right, quiet. Hey. Don't be afraid. Take it easy. Somebody switch on that light. <laughs> you don't dare turn on those lights. What do you mean? If you do, every man here will be blown to bits. What are you talking about? I took that explosive bulb you had on the table in front of you. What? When I turned out the light, I put it into one of the light sockets. <laughs> Now, Mr. Brayton, do you want to turn on the light? You're bluffing, Shadow. All you have to do to prove that point is to throw on the light switch. Hey, hey, what's that? It's a lot of cars driving up outside. It's the police, gentlemen. They'll never take me alive. Alive or dead, Brayton, you've got to be taken. Hey, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Come out in ten seconds. I will come in after you. You might as well do as Commissioner Weston commands. Walk out the door with your hands in the air. There's nobody walking out of this place. I know I'm chair bait. I'll die anyway. But there's one thing I'm going to do first. I'm going to take you along with me, Mr. Shadow. Hey, keep your hands off that switch. Get out of my way. Here we go, Commissioner. Get back, Mom. Oh, Mom. Anyone alive in there, Captain? Not a single one, Commissioner. It's all right, Margot. I'm safe. Oh, Lamar, thank heaven. I thought you'd been killed in that explosion. It was close, Margot. But I got out when they were trying to keep Aiden away from the light switch. You go back to the tower now, Margot. I'll be with you in a minute. Commissioner Weston. Commissioner Weston. Hello, oh, is that you, Shadow? Yes, Commissioner. Well, we're in a fine jam now. They're all dead. How are we going to find out where the other explosive bulbs are planted? It's all right, Commissioner. I got Brayton's chart showing the location of the explosives. Where is it? You'll find it in the front seat of your car. Then the city is safe. Yes, Commissioner. Good. All right, men. Get in your cars. We've got to gather up those lamps right away. And my gratitude, Shadow, for a job well done. Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town, student of science, and master of other people's minds. Using advanced methods that may ultimately become available to all law enforcement agencies, Cranston is known to criminals and evildoers as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, as haunting to superstitious minds, as a ghost, as inevitable, as a guilty conscience. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice belongs. Today's story, Murder in E-Flat. Well, I'm sorry, 
You got room for it? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Hey, wait a minute. Two more chairs. What do you think of this man? <laughs> hey, wait. Boy, this kid, he's not like the hottest cousin in town. Well, I'll still take Louis Kramer. Boy, that's my idea. Oh, quiet. Now, let's listen. All right. Come on. 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 Come on.
Silence. Silence. That infernal words put in every note we found. Yes, sir. What's the laboratory report, Sergeant? What explodes the bomb? A bomb's attached to a photoelectric cell. One of these here U-shaped pieces of metal like uh, we've been finding at all the bombing. I see. Well, how's it work? Well, it's sort of like this, Commissioner. The laboratory says that this U-shaped piece of metal is a tuning fork, an E-flat tuning fork. Yes? Well, this here tuning fork is placed so that when the sound of E-flat vibrates, it breaks the light beam of the photoelectric cell that's attached to the bomb. And when the light beam is broken, the circuit's closed, the bomb goes off. Uh-huh. I think I see what you mean. Just like just like your body breaks a light beam and opens the door to somebody's new hotel. Yes, sir. Yes, that's the idea. Uh-huh. There were sounds reported just before each of those bombings. The sound of that trumpet, that auto horn, and that foghorn, and that freighter, and the noise of those airplane motors. Yes, sir. They could have done it all right. Whoever thought that one up is dumb, like Einstein. But I, I still don't get these notes, these warnings about silence. There must be some reason why... I... Hello, Commissioner Weston speaking. Hello, Commissioner. A shadow. Right you are, Commissioner. Well, what do you want? I'm busy, very busy, and I'm afraid I haven't any time to... I know, Commissioner. These bombings are getting a bit out of hand, aren't they? And I suppose you know all about them. No, not all. These pieces of U-shaped metal you've been finding... Tuning forks, aren't they? How did you know that? Never mind. Aren't they? Yes. Is that what our laboratory calls them? E-flat tuning forks. Hooked up to a photoelectric cell attached to the bomb. When the sound vibrates the fork, it passes in front of the cell's light beam, and that... And that closes the circuit and explodes the bomb. Very neat, eh, Commissioner? Very. Anything else I can do for you? Just one thing more, Commissioner. Yes? Do you realize what all this means? Why, of Each course of I... the notes has contained the word silence. You must broadcast a general warning to the city at once. Use the radio, use the newspapers. Use any means at your command. But warn the people immediately that there must be absolute silence until the murderer is caught. They must not play any musical instruments, blow their auto horns. In fact, they must not do anything to make a loud noise of any kind that might set off another of these tuning fork bombs. For the penalty may be death. Right here, they found one of the bombs. Hidden in one of these trash baskets. Yeah. Imagine it right here at one of the busiest corners in the city. I tell you, it's enough to give it a creep. It certainly is. Look up the avenue there. Here it is the middle of the day and not a car in sight. Boy, I haven't had my car out of the garage since the police commissioner broadcast that warning. Think of it. He said even a squeaking brake might send you to Kingdom Come. Well, I can tell you, Kingdom Come would be better than this. They don't find the guy that's planting these bombs soon. The whole town's gone off its nuts. You're telling me. I haven't slept in four nights. It's awful silence. It's like a wet blanket over your face. Day after day, and nothing stops. Stop painting that floor, Robert. You're making me so nervous I could scream. <laughs> you nervous. That's good. How about me? I tell you, I can't stand the silence much longer. I tell you, I can't stand... Quiet, Robert. Remember Commissioner Weston's warning. No one knows where the bombs are planted. Even a shout might... I know, I know. Even a shout might be an E-flat. A note of death. That's what they're calling it now. It's silly, isn't it? But what do they call this? This awful tomb we're living in? Quiet, Robert, please. Come on. We're going to get out of this town. Start packing. We'll leave you on the first train. I don't know where we're going, but we're going anywhere. Any luck, Margot? No, Lamont. You? None. Commissioner Weston has already checked all the music stores, but I... I still feel he might have overlooked one. Several of the stores I checked had sold tuning forks recently, but only one was an E-flat. And that was purchased by the Board of Education. It's beginning to look hopeless, isn't it, Lamont? Not yet, Margot. Not until we've checked every music store in the city. Now, here's the list of stores. We'll separate again. You take these I've marked in the list, now visit the others. Yes, Lamont. I'm sorry, Margot. Every minute moves us closer to the next explosion. God, God isn't it? All morning as I walked these deserted streets, I felt like I was moving through some city of the dead. Yes, it's it's like a plague. A plague of silence. But we must be on our way, Margot. It's not a moment to lose. I'll meet you at the Andrews Music Store, the first store we visited this morning. Yes, yes, I know the one. I'll see you there. Hello, oh, sir. We haven't sold an E-flat tuning fork in months. Is there anything else, sir? No, oh, miss. We're wholesale, you see. We only sell to music schools and such. Even they don't buy tuning forks very often. What's that, mister? Tuning forks? Uh, no, we just handle sheet music, radios, and records. Maybe you'd like some sheet music. Hey, 
And uh, what can I do for you, miss? Nothing, thank you. I'm just waiting for someone, if you don't mind. Oh, no, not at all. By the way, weren't you in here this morning? Yes, I was. Yes, I remember you now. You were with a gentleman who wanted to know if we'd sold any tuning forks lately. Yes, that's right. You said you hadn't. Yes, and after you left, I did remember one sale, but that was to one of our regular customers, and it was it was a long time ago. That wouldn't be what you... No. Were... No, I suppose not. No. Dr. Badeau is a very fine man. Fine musician, too. He's bought a number of musical instruments from us. Of course, it did strike me a bit odd. Uh, odd? What was odd? Well, Dr. Badeau wanting all of those tuning forks for the same pitch. E-flat, I believe it was. E-flat? Yes, but you know how musicians are. Surely you don't. Oh, no, of course not, but I... I suppose I should see this Dr. Badeau, just for the record, you know. Uh, would you like his address, then? Yes, if you'd be so kind. Yes, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll write it down for you. Dr. Andre Bedeau, 2218 West 9th Street. Nice. Well, thank you. And if the gentleman I'm waiting for should arrive while I'm gone, tell him to wait. Uh, yes, yes. His I name will... is Lamont Cranston. If I'm delayed, tell him to meet me at Dr. Bedeau's. 2218, yes, yes. Uh, yes? Dr. Bedeau? Yes, that is right. Dr. Bedeau. Doctor of Music. Bachelor of Art. And you, my dear? My name is Margot Lane, Doctor. I'm a voice student. Oh, musician. And so beautiful. <laughs> Do come in. Thank you. This is my studio. Oh, it's charming. You teach here? No, oh, no, no. I, I seldom teach, my dear. I am composer. Great composer. <laughs> Though I'm afraid that is still my own little secret. <laughs> but then you wouldn't have time for a simple student like myself. No, no, no. On the contrary, my dear. It has always, always been my special pleasure to encourage real talent. Especially a beautiful talent. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, that's very nice, but I'm not awfully talented, Monsieur Vidot. I, I don't really believe you'd be interested. No, no, but I have already decided I would be interested. Most interested. <laughs> but first... You are just in time for a treat. A rare treat. Well, I'm afraid I must go now. I just remembered an appointment. You should have remembered that before you interrupted my work. Now that you are here, you shall remain on until it is my pleasure to dismiss you. you. You can't do that. Quiet. Sit down. There. I did not ask you to disturb me. But now that you are here, you shall share a secret with me. You like secrets, no? <laughs> Most young women like secrets, but can't keep them. <laughs> I rather think you shall keep this one, my dear. Cheryl! Cheryl! Yeah, what is that? What, what did you say? What? Oh, oh. <laughs> you are wasting your breath, my dear. Really, you are. The studio is soundproof. Completely soundproof. And now for my secret. You, <laughs> you see this beautiful electric organ? Yes. Yes, of course, this but This electric I... organ shall reveal my secret. My greatest composition. I shall play it for you now on this beautiful organ. <laughs> oh, pardon me just a moment, my dear. The door seems to have blown open. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Turn of the lock will guard us against the king of Don't lock that door. You hear me? Let me out of here. Quiet. Quiet. Really, you don't seem to realize what a great honor I am to sport bestow on you. For you shall be my first and the last to hear my greatest composition, my symphony of silence no. in E flat. No. Uh, do I frighten you, my child? <laughs> I'm so sorry. But you are my uninvited guest, aren't you? My only guest. <laughs> the lighting is quite poor for shadows, my dear. There are no shadows in my studio. No, oh, one thing more. Be- before I play my symphony for you... You see the black box on that pedestal there? Answer me, do you? Yes. Yes, I see it. That box is my invention. It is a bomb. The same as others I have placed about the city. And it shall permit you and me to die. You see, my dear, into the final climax of my symphony, I have written the final climax of life itself. (laughs) Yeah, but enough of this program notes. Yeah, let us begin the performance. (laughs) 
Peter. Listen, my dear. Listen to the pale beauty of the whole tone. Truly a feast, isn't it? A feast for just the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Three, Dr. Bendo. Three of us. Hello. He told you where I was. Three. Three. No, who speaks? I am the shadow. Yes, the shadow. Oh, yes, yes. Of course, my, my inner voice. My shadow. <laughs> the shadow of my poor, weak conscience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, shadow. The three of us. Yes, yes, that's right. We've had an exciting time lately, haven't we, Bato? You, the master. I... Your shadow. <laughs> Quite exciting, my shadow. <laughs> and it has led us to victory. Yes, we have at last won our war on noise. The silent city pays tribute to our cause. But why, Bado? Why have we waged this war on the city? Why these bombings? Why this terror? Uh, you forget so soon. Uh, what a poor conscience you are, shadow. <laughs> but once more, I will tell you... We have been waging the war, the war of wars, the war for peace. For only the true peace is a simple peace of silence. Yes, but no, but... Quiet, quiet, my conscience. Silence is the only way to fight the unhappiness in the world today. This world of ours with its war, its chaos, its noise. Yes, yes, above all, its noise. How many of our bombs are still unexploded, Bado? How many? Three throughout the city, my forgetful shadow. And one here on the pedestal, waiting to play its part in my symphony of silence. Waiting for me to play E-flat. But the three in the city, Bado, where did we leave them? Oh, what a poor conscience you are, Shadow. <laughs> One's conscience should not forget so often. Yeah, but I, I will forgive you. Don't you remember the one we left in the elevator shaft of the state building? Yes, I remember now. Very clever of us, wasn't it, Bado? <laughs> and another we planted behind the timer's bell in the sports armory. Oh, but of course. How stupid of me to forget. And the third, in the grand terminal. Three noisy places, without a doubt. Yeah, but noisy no longer. The city is as silent as a tomb. And so long as it remains silent, so too will the bombs. Yeah, but now, now my symphony reaches its climax. My work is finished. Listen to the compelling beauty of the finale. Hear, hear those old tones. Marching up, up, up. Yes. <laughs> it's the work of a master. I, Beto, the greatest of them all. And now, now the final suspension. And, and the final resolution. The finale of my symphony in silence. There they are, Just rest a minute. Everything is all right. But the explosion, Lamont. There was no explosion. But Dr. Bedeau, look. Lying there across the keyboard. Is he... Yes. Dead. Quite dead. It was Bedeau's body pressing against the keyboard that caused the rumbling you thought was an explosion. But I, I still don't understand. What happened? All the time I was talking to Bedeau, I was standing beside the pedestal on which he placed the bomb. When he started to play the organ, I disconnected the photoelectric cell from the bomb, making it harmless. But Bedeau is dead. Heart failure, my dear Margot. A victim of his own hypnosis. He was so sure that the explosion would occur that it did in his distorted mind. Oh, thank heaven it's all over. Yes, the symphony of silence is over. The terror is ended. Once more, the city can return to its normal life. Once more, its people are safe to work and play, laugh and cry, free from the terror that has nearly driven the men. Yes, and once more, man has learned that there is only one musician who can play the cosmic music of silence and sound. The master musician of them all, the composer of life itself. <laughs> Let no man tempt you into crime. For crime is like a strangling serpent.
crushes him who feeds it most. Beware, lest the serpent of crime ensnare you in his folds. Remember, crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> waiting for the first act of the Shadow's latest adventure to begin, I'd like to ask every motorist to do this. Take a ride on the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown tire. See for yourself how it grips wet, slippery roads like you never felt a tire grip before. That's because the amazing Silvertown Lifesaver tread acts like a battery of windshield wipers. Sweeps wet roads so dry you can light a match on its track. For the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had... Equip your car with Goodrich Silvertown Tires. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids those in distress and helps the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice belongs. The only one who knows the true identity of that master of other people's minds, the shadow. Today's story, The Man Who Murdered Time. Yes, sir? Mr. Cranston, on behalf of all the employees of the club, I wish to thank you for your generous New Year's gift to the personnel. That's quite all right, Stuart. Happy New Year. The same to you, sir. And may I thank you, too, Mr. Hughes, for your gift. You're very welcome, Stuart. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Mr. I wish I could have made it more, Cranston, but it hasn't been a terribly good year for me. Well, I'm sorry to hear it, Hughes. Oh, by the way, how is Mrs. Hughes feeling these days? Poorly. Well, the doctors at the sanitarium say she may pull out of it next year. That's why I'm looking forward to the New Year so eagerly. Well, Hughes, if uh, there's anything I can do in the way of financial assistance... Thanks, old man, but it won't be necessary. I expect to be out of debt very shortly. Business improving? No, a trust fund is coming due in two weeks. Inheritance from my Uncle Matthew, you know. Well, I'm delighted to hear it, you, sir. It's four o'clock. Well, only eight hours to a brand new year and new hope for all of us. Amen to that. Hey, you're coming to my New Year's Eve party tonight, aren't oh, you? Oh, I meant to tell you, Cranston. Uh, I'll be late. I got a call this morning from a second cousin of mine. He wants me to come to see him this evening. Brilliant scientist, but I suspect he's losing his mind. Oh? <laughs> know what he claims to have invented? A time machine. A, a time machine? Yes. Fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> Come, Hughes. Is anything really fantastic in the modern world of science? Thirty years ago, the notion that a human voice could circle the Earth without the aid of wires would have been called not only fantastic, but impossible. Radio, electric light, airplanes, all were called fantastic in their time, but today they're accepted facts. Why not the time machine? <laughs> well, I'm from Missouri. Anyway, I'm really going to see my cousin, not because of his alleged invention, but uh, because he's dying. Oh, that's too bad. Yes, the poor chap's got an incurable heart condition. It's, uh, he told me his doctors don't give him more than a few days to live. Well, I've got to be off. And see you tonight, then, Hughes. Only a miracle will keep me away, Cranston. <laughs> a miracle like, like the time machine. <laughs> <laughs> Drink this water. There. Feel better now? Yes. Yes, better use. Perhaps you'd better get into bed, Willard. <sighs> Frankly, I, I didn't expect to find you up and about, dressed to kill. Dressed to kill. Very good. Such an apt phrase. 
Well, why not? This is probably the last day of my life. Well, I'm sure it's not as bad as all that, will it? If you take care of yourself... Come, come, use. I'll never see the new year. That's what you're really thinking. Know what I've done today? What, will it? The things I've wanted to do all my life. Packed them all into this one long, glorious day. I've smoked two dollar cigars, eaten the finest foods, bought thousands of dollars worth of completely useless things just for the fun of indulging myself. Will it? I thought this <laughs> that I'm broke? I am. Then how did you... Borrowed, dear cousin. Spent other people's money, incurred enormous debts. <laughs> Payable next year. Next year, which will never come. I'm sorry, Willard. Oh, what are you sorry about? I'm not. Matter of fact, I've just begun to celebrate. And you must join me, Hughes. Absolutely insist. I bought a marvelous sherry today, a rare vintage. You rang, sir? Uh, well, you needn't bother. The sherry, John. Yes, sir. I have it here, sir. Fine, fine. Put it on the table. Shall I pour, sir? No, I'll do it myself. That's all, John. Very good. Hey, you are use. Drink hearty. Thank you. How do you like it? Nectar. Ambrosia, huh? It has a peculiar flavor, hasn't it? Oh, it'll grow on you. Finish it, use. Drink to my last day on earth. Oh, no, no, will it? Not to that. To my last day on earth. And yours, my dear cousin. To my last day? Use, I told you that today I meant to satisfy every ambition I ever had. Well... I've left for the last my greatest ambition of all. To kill you. To kill me? Why, well, you, you're joking. Think so, Hughes? But, but why? What have I ever done to you? What haven't you done to me? You've been a bone in my throat ever since we were boys together. I, I believe you're, you're really but serious. If it hadn't been for you, I'd have been Uncle Matthew's fair-haired boy, his favorite, his pet... He would have raised me in luxury instead of you. You quarreled with him. You were. He would have left me his money, not you, you Judas. You had everything while I starved, scraped, suffered. I brooded over that, my fine cousin, a whole lifetime. And now, this wonderful day, this last day of the year, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you not once, but a thousand times. You see that machine in the corner? I see, Willard. Calm down. That's my time machine. Your, your time machine, yes. I remember your saying... Do you know what this machine can do? It can prevent the future from happening. <laughs> the future from happening? Oh, now, now, look, Willard, look. Let me call your physician. I'll Let be a me... fool. I'm the same as you are. That's a scientific machine, not a madman's toy. Do you know how it works? Well, of course not. I'll explain it in simple terms. Use what is time. Time is... Time, time is... is like a railroad track. A straight railroad track used, and the world is a train running along that track. On the track behind us lies yesterday, December 30th. The day we're traveling along that section of track was called December 31st. And at midnight tonight, the train, you, I, the whole universe, is scheduled to plunge straight ahead into January 1st of the new year. You follow me so far, you? Yes, what has this to do with your so-called time machine? Just this. By using a revolutionary principle of physics, my own discovery, my machine bends the straight track of time, curves it, curves it, so that the time track forms a perfect circle. <laughs> you fool, it's a scientific fact. I've done it. Oh, mad, I say, mad. Listen to me, Hughes. At midnight tonight, when I turn on the switch, time will instantly be curved back on itself, so that instead of continuing into January 1st, We'll go back 24 hours. We'll live December 31st over again and again and again like a phonograph needle caught in a groove. Do you to believe that this day will never end? That you can make December 31st repeat itself forever? <laughs> laugh, you fool. <laughs> you won't last long. Today I've been especially careful to make it the fullest, happiest day of my life because I'm going to live this wonderful day forever. I'll catch time in that groove and hold it there. The future will never come. I'll never have to pay my debt. Despite my bad heart, I'll never die. Well, I'll have to be as insane as you to believe that. Would you like a demonstration? Bring the farce out to the end, are you? Well, go ahead. Demonstrate. That's the proper scientific spirit, use. I'll set the machine to affect merely this house and ourselves. What incident of the last half hour do you want me to make repeat itself? Choose. Oh, the butler and the sherry. John and the sherry, eh? Very good. And I want you to bear in mind... That just as time will be repeated here in this room for the next few moments, 
So can I repeat time throughout the whole world, not once, but again and again. Now, let me adjust my machine. There. Now to close the circuit. Really, Willard. Uh, John. Yes, sir. I have it here, sir. Fine, fine. Put it on the table. Did I pour, sir? No, I'll do it myself. That's all, John. Very good, sir. There. The automatic circuit cut us off, and we're back in ordinary time again. Convinced, Hughes? It can't be. It's impossible. It's a trick. A dream. A nightmare. You'll be saying that for all eternity. I'm getting out of here. Are you, cousin? Try it if you can. <laughs> I can't. I'm paralyzed. I, I can't get out of this chair. You feel pain now, don't you, you? Yes. Yes, horrible pain. You shouldn't have drunk the sherry you Your glass contained the slow poison, you see. No. No, help. Help. There's an antidote on the table. You see that little green bottle you is just beyond the reach of your fingers? Isn't it ironic? If you could only move your arm five inches. Try. Oh, you can't. Dear me, how very, very bad. All you can do is look at the antidote while you die in agony. Please, please, will it help me? Help me! I don't want to die! Just a little while now, cousin. A little while. It's almost midnight. You'll die just before midnight. And then I'll turn on my machine. Set it to affect the whole world forever and time all over the world and snap back 24 hours. Everybody in the world will live December 31st over again and again, forever and ever. <laughs> you too, you. No, no. You'll visit me again. Drink the poison cherry again. Die again. Live again. Die again. New Year's Eve party I ever attended. Margo, you danced beautifully. <laughs> Thanks, Lamont. I wonder what's happened to you. You said he'd be late, but I didn't... Hold it, everybody! Here comes the New Year! Lamont, where are we? I'm still in your arms dancing with you, but it, it's not the party, the, the New Year's Eve party in your apartment. How could that be? I, I don't know, Margot. What, what was that awful crash? I don't know. But look around you, Margot. We're dancing in the Honolulu Club. But we were dancing in the Honolulu Club right here last night. Last night at midnight. I, I mean, 24 hours ago. Oh, I, I don't know what I mean. Keep dancing with me, Margo. I've got to figure this out. It seems like a dream. And yet... That's it, Lamont. It's a dream. I dreamed through the whole day, December 31st, right up to midnight. Then that crash. And I woke up here in the Honolulu Club. Margo, it wasn't a dream, I tell you. Then what was it, Lamont? I don't know. I don't know. But something's gone wrong, Margo. Something's gone wrong with the whole world. But everything seems all right, Lamont. Margo. Hold on to me. Don't let go. Let's walk back to our table. Well, all right, but I don't understand. Keep holding on. Margo, do you remember last night, just about this time as we were dancing, a waiter accidentally dropped a whole tray full of dishes? Well, yes, that, that's so, Lamont. <coughs> Lamont, it's happened. He dropped it just as he did last night. Yes. I see it all now, Margo. We actually lived through December 31st. We, everybody, the whole world... But just as the last stroke of midnight came, something happened to time. Time? Yes. Time snapped back 24 hours. Instead of going on to January 1st, the world went back to the first moment of December 31st. 
But nobody else seems to realize what's happened. Yes, that is strange. Apparently, everybody's forgotten that they lived through the last day of the year. Why do we remember? Margot, I believe that the same power that makes me invisible to others has something to do with this. What do you mean, Lamont? Years ago in India, I was studying with the yogi priests. I developed my powers of concentration, my power of will, to such an extent that apparently this accident of time doesn't affect me. How long I'll be able to fight against it, I don't know. But I haven't your power, Lamont. Why do I remember, too? Margot? Because at the instant time flashed back, you happened to be dancing with me. You were in my arms, within the aura of my will, my influence. No. Just so long as you're touching me, you'll remember too. Oh, Lamont, I can't believe it. I can't. Well, then try it. Let go of me. Go on, let go, Mother. Well, all right. You're right, Lamont. You remember the Higgins, don't you? Margo. Yes, that's the family. Margo, stop. Well, they're very Margo, anxious that me. you and I go south Margo. of the beach. Margo. Uh, what am I saying? What happened? Oh, Lamont, you're holding me again. Margo, the instant you let go of me, you said exactly what you said 24 hours before. When I grabbed you, you snapped back, free of the new time spell. Then it's true. Oh, Lamont, I'm afraid. Don't let go of me. Steady, Margo. Oh, but it's horrible. People will go on living through December 31st to eternity, never knowing, never realizing. Lamont, there'll never be a new year. You're absolutely right. Unless this can be stopped. But how can anyone stop it? Nothing human could have caused a thing like this to happen. I'm not so sure, Margot. News told me that a cousin of his, a brilliant scientist, claimed to have invented a time machine. That cousin of yours may be responsible for what's happened to time. But who is this man? Where did he live? You just didn't say. I'll have to find him some way. And when I do, Margot, it'll be as the shadow. Perhaps the shadow will be able to switch time back to normal. Bring the new year to a world doomed to live a day which never ends. In just a minute, the curtain rises on Act Two of The Shadow's Adventure. Meanwhile, a word to you motorists. Do you slow down passing a school? Do you pass other cars on a hill? Do you come to a full stop at street intersections? The shadow wonders. The terrific toll of deaths and injuries indicates that too many motorists fail to exercise caution, fail to consider the other fellow. Play safe. It pays. And motorists, here's one thing more. If you only realize the importance that safe tires, too, play in safe motoring, you wouldn't hesitate a minute to put the new Goodrich Safety Silver Towns with the Lifesaver Tread on your car. For remember, this new Silvertown is much more than a new tire. It's a new kind of tire safety. On the inside, it has the famous blowout protection of the Goodrich Golden Fly. And on the outside, it has the amazing new Lifesaver Tread. The tread that sweeps wet roads so dry, you can actually light a match on its track. Yes, sir, that's plenty dry. So it's hardly surprising that Silvertowns will give you the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had. Keep holding on to me. I will, Lamont. We can walk. My apartment isn't far. Oh, why don't you let me come with you? No, Margot. This is the shadow's job. Maybe dangerous. I want you to be safe. Safe in a world gone mad? Oh. Right, don't watch yourself. The streets are slippery with ice. Here. Hold on to me more tightly. Right. We'll cross here. Yes, Margot. And it'll happen all over again every 24 hours from now until doomsday. Oh, it's frightening. Think of that woman over and over. Unless I can put time back on its pack, Margot. I must. Let's hurry. Oh, look at that poor Margo. man shivering in the doorway there. He hasn't even an overcoat. He looks hungry, poor devil. Margot, remember last night? In a moment, he'll step out of that doorway and ask me for a dime. Excuse me, mister. Could you give me a dime for a cup of coffee? I'm so cold, I'm freezing. Oh, thanks. 
Precisely. There's one thing I'm glad of, Lamont. He doesn't know. He doesn't know he's doomed to shiver and freeze and starve like that forever. And millions like him. Millions of unfortunate shivering and starving all over the world tonight. That machine. I must find that machine. Well, here we are, Margot. Don't bother to take me up. There's so much for you to do. So much, Lamont. The doorman will let me in. It's exactly the same time we got home last night. Good evening, Miss Lane. Bad night, ain't it? Hurry, Lamont. Find Hughes' cousin. Since time's repeating himself. Well, I always say when... Hughes will meet me in the afternoon at my club. Just as he met me yesterday. We'll talk as we talk then. Perhaps he'd be able to tell me... Lamont, what's the matter? You're so pale suddenly. It's funny. I felt weak just then. As if my strength, the strength of my will were fading away... Could it be that Lamont, I too... you mustn't. You've got to be strong. The world needs your strength. Well, Let go of me, Margot. All right. You're draining my power. My strength away. Let go. The wind is very fighting, Miss Lane. Yes, it is. Fred, will you take me up to my apartment? Please? Yes, sure, Miss Lane. Gone. Safe upstairs. Goodbye, Margot. Until tomorrow. Tomorrow, Heba comes. <laughs> On behalf of all the employees of the club, I wish to thank you for your generous Stuart, New Year's gift to the club. Listen personnel. to me. Can't you hear? Don't you understand what I'm saying, saying to you? And may I thank you, too, Mr. Hughes, for your gift. You're Stuart. welcome, Stuart. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Stuart, stop. I wish I could have made it more, Cranston, but it hasn't been a terribly good year for Hughes, me. let me take your hand. You're merely repeating what you said 24 hours ago. Fully, though. Now, listen to me. You may pull out of Who it is your friend? That's why Who I'm is he? Who does he live New Year so eagerly? Oh, hopeless. He's not attuned to my will. I'll have to follow him. Make him lead me to this cousin of his. Expect to the be out of death very shortly. I must concentrate. My will power seems to be failing. I must hold on until Hughes visits his cousin. <laughs> It's impossible, Willard. It's a trick, a dream, a nightmare. You'll be saying that for all eternity. I'm getting out of here. Are you, cousin? Try to, if you can. I can't. I can't. I'm paralyzed. I can't get out of this chair. You, you can. You You're not paralyzed. Pain now, yes. don't you? you? Yes, horrible pain. You, there is no pain. You None. shouldn't have drunk. You, hear me. Your glass has seen the slow poison. No, no, help, help. I have helped you, you. You are not poisoned. I substituted this antidote for the poison of the glass of Sherry Willis handed you. You are not poisoned, I tell you. Exert your will, refuse it to mind. Try to get out of that chair. Yes. Hold me. Hold me. Now try it. Uh, I've broken the grip of the time spell a little. I made something happen that didn't happen yesterday. You did something just now you didn't do then. You drank the antidote instead of the poison. Try. Try yours. I heard a voice. A voice. But there's no one here. No one but... but... Try. Try it, then. Chair. Out the chair. Ah. Uh, I'm standing. I'm free. Free. Thank the Lord. Hughes, can you hear me now? Who are you? Who are you? I, I see only Willis. I don't think he sees me. I, I feel someone holding me. Who are you? Never mind who I am, Hughes. Get out of this house at once. Go to the home of your friend, the one Cranston. Yes, yes. You are to attend the New Year's Eve party there. Remember? Yes, I, I seem to remember. Go now, yours. You don't need me to hold you now. I will you to go. Yes, a little yes, while yes. now, sir. A little while. It's almost midnight. You'll die just before midnight. <laughs> I... Where am I? Who is that? Ah, uh, you feel my power now, Willard. I hold it you fast. Fast. Some invisible force. And it speaks. Who are you? Who? I am the shadow. The shadow? Dr. Willard, you are guilty of the greatest crime ever perpetrated against mankind. You thought to condemn the rest of the world to an eternity of cold and darkness and suffering. No, no, I didn't mean to do that. You wanted an eternal life of pleasure, of evil. You tried to stave off forever the death that hung over you like a soul. I don't want to 
your job. You just satisfy your selfishness. You tried to. You did break the laws of nature. And so you must be punished, Dr. Woodard. Punished? Oh. In a moment, I shall smash your devilish time machine. Oh. Reduce it to splinters and scrap. And the instant the machine is smashed, time will snap back to normal. Instantaneously, time will take up where it left off. When you put the machine into operation. And so will come what you thought to destroy forever. The new year. The blessed new year. That means new hope and happiness for the good and the innocent people of the world. While for you, it will bring what God decreed for you. Death. No. No, don't smash the machine. Give me one more day of life. Just one. And I'll smash it myself. Not one hour. Not one oh. minute. Not one second. Don't let me die. Stop. Happy New Year. New Year? Yes, yes. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, you. Happy New Year. As a matter of fact, Lamont, it seems to me I had a dream, too. The strangest sort of dream. Perhaps you did, Margot. Well, anyway, Happy New Year, Lamont. Happy New Year. is based on a story copyrighted by the Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is now on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Gave me the pass to the prison. 
Yes, I was afraid he might be playing a joke on me. It might be a fake. Oh, the pass is quite good, quite good. Entitled you to a complete tour of the prison. Well, I will. It'll be something to tell the folks back home. Oh, uh, excuse me, guard. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? Uh, not at all. What is it? That little gray building down there across the courtyard. What is that? That's the death house. The... Oh. Oh. I, I don't suppose you take visitors in there, too, do you? Oh, yes. Yes, certainly. Uh, you want to see it, of course. Well, Mr. Keezy, uh... Well, I guess it would be a thrill. Thrill? Yes. Yes, it would be the greatest thrill you've ever experienced. <laughs> What place is this, Mr. Keezy? The building you saw across the courtyard, the death house. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, don't be afraid. Uh, step right in. Oh, well, thank you. There, you see. It's not an unpleasant room at all, is it? Well, not in appearance, no. But, Mr. Keezy, when you start to think of the men that have died here, what... Oh, nonsense. Death has nothing to fear. There's a majesty or nobility about it that makes people's revulsion stupid. Uh, those benches there are the observer seats. Uh-huh. The pre-execution cells are just beyond that door. Uh-huh. And uh, this, as you see, is the electric chair. Yeah. Uh, say, uh, it's quite warm in here, isn't it? I suppose a bit. Uh, this panel here is where the executioner stands. He holds his hand on the switch and at a signal from the warden, he throws it in. Like this. <gasps> oh, now, don't be alarmed. Shouldn't, shouldn't we leave now? Uh, first, of course, you want to sit in a chair? But... No, no, I, I, I hadn't thought of anything like that at all. I don't... Oh, my, my. You're a timid soul. <laughs> Why, this is an experience you'll never have again. <laughs> Here, let me help you. Just uh, sit right down. Well, if it's a customary thing, why... Of course, there you are. You see, nothing to it at all, is there? Imagine that. Men have died just like this. Yes, men have died. Just like that. Here, yes. I'll show you how it feels to be strapped in. Well, I I, I can imagine how I... I... There, the chest strap across him. <laughs> You've drawn that a bit tight, Mr. Keezy. I took the wind out of me. That's the way it goes. Now, the right arm strap, like that. And the left. Oh, this thing... Certainly hugs a man close, doesn't it? Yes. It's a powerful embrace. Now we'll strap the left leg and the right leg like this. Now, there you are. Ready for the most noble and majestic experience of all. God. What do you mean? Death. No. No. Keep away from that. Don't. Don't. Visitor dies in death house. Read all about it. Visitor dies in death house. Extra, extra. Visitor dies in death house. Shall I call you a taxi, sir? Yes, please. Well, Margo, how did you like the opera? Oh, it was simply grand, Lamont. But I'm tired. I'll be glad to get home. Read all about it. Extra. Visitor dies in death house. Extra, What's that? Extra. Visitor dies in death house. Oh, now, Lamont, please, let's not spoil a lovely night with scare headlines. People are liable to die most any place. Your cab, sir? Read all about it. Visitor dies in death house. A boy. A boy. Our cab's waiting, Lamont. Uh, just a moment, Margo. I have reason for wanting to know the story back of that headline. Paper, sir? Uh, yes, son. Now, there you are. Oh, thank you, sir. Read all about it. Text. All right, Margo. Five, Sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right. Oh, I know you're just dying to get to your story, so go right ahead, Lamont. Go ahead, read it. Here, I'll switch on the light. Well, thank you, Margo. Well, there isn't much to it. Newspaper's strangely brief. Merely the headlines and a seven-line box on the first page. What does it say? 
simply that a visitor died in the death house on a tour of inspection. There doesn't seem much in that to excite the imagination of the shadow. I'm not so sure about that, Margot. Surely you don't see anything sinister in such a bare announcement, Lamont? That's just the point, Margot. The account is too bare. What do you mean? Well, the newspapers don't seem to know anything. And it says here that the prison officials are saying nothing. Oh, perhaps there's nothing more to say. There's an old proverb, Margot, to the effect that virtue rarely lies behind a tight lip. Well, I noticed that ferret gleam in your eyes, so I might as well accustom myself to the idea that you're off on another adventure in crime. Yes, Margot. Off on an adventure that promises to be one of the most exciting I've ever had. speaking. What? You can't get the warden on the phone? Yeah, yeah, I can't. This is the police department. He can't ignore us. Well, you try him again and keep trying until you get him. Now, hold on a minute, boys. Brophy. Yeah? What happened when you went out to prison? Well, the same thing that happened to your phone call, Chief. Nothing. Couldn't you get any information? All I could find out was that the guy was in town on the furniture convention. He got a pass to see the prison, and some guard by the name of Keezy took him through. Did you question this Keezy? He couldn't get a hold of it. Why not? Well, Chief, we found out that he lived way up on the Cape, so Jim here and me went out there. And then what happened? Nothing. If somebody says nothing to me again, I'll... Just a minute. Yes. Hello? Commissioner Weston speaking. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioner Weston. Oh, you again. Yes, Commissioner. The shadow. Just a minute. Hold the line. Uh, you men wait outside. I'll call you if I need you. Okay, Commissioner. We'll be right back. All right, Shadow. Go ahead. What's on your mind? I called to find out what you know about the death of that visitor out of the prison. I don't know a thing, and I can't find out anything. The prison officials don't seem inclined to cooperate at all. Did you know, Commissioner, that a short time ago another visitor died in the death house? What? Another visitor? Yes. The first visitor's death passed almost unnoticed. But now, Commissioner, another. Say, this puts a new light on the whole matter. Calls for immediate action. No, Commissioner. Hold everything until you hear from me. Oh, hello, Margot. Come in. Uh, Don't take your hat off. We're leaving right away. I just get to your house, and then we have to leave. What's all the haste about? We're driving up to the prison. Oh, Lamont, don't tell me you're still thinking of that visitor's death. Thinking of it? Margot, I've discovered some things that make me feel I've got a big job on my hands. For one thing, I've discovered that another visitor died in that same death house. I've come to the conclusion that there's only one way I can find out what's back of it all. And how is that? Here. You see this? It's a visitor's pass. Yes. I'm going up there and go through that prison, just as those other men went through as a visitor. Oh, no. No, Lamont, you mustn't. I've got to, Margot. It's the only way. Well, I'm not usually given to superstition, Lamont, but there's something supernatural, something unearthly about those deaths. I don't want you to expose yourself to the same fate that overtook those poor men. I I won't let you do it. Come now, Margot. Don't let this get the best of you. Oh, Lamont, I... I'm afraid. I'm afraid. <laughs> the entrance to the prison down there at the bottom of the hill. Lamont, I wish you wouldn't go through with this. You may be walking to your death. Don't worry, Margot. You stay here in the car. And remember this. Don't lose your courage, no matter what you may hear or what you may see. Hello, Keezy. You here again? Yes, Mr. Harper. I'm taking this gentleman, Mr. Cranston, on a tour of our institution. You'll have to be searched, sir. Lay down, please. There you are. How are they going to stop handing out these visitors' passes, Keezy? Stop? Why should they do that? Well, I should think they'd be a little more careful because of what's already happened around here. Oh, nonsense, Mr. Harper. Accidents will happen, you know. No reason why prison routine should be upset unnecessarily. All right, Mr. Cranston, you're okay. Thank you. Open up, Tom. Right. Okay, Keezy, the place is yours. Thank you. Come right along, sir. Don't forget, Keezy. Bring him back alive. <laughs> so, this is the death house. 
Grant's name, Keezy? Uh, yes, Mr. Grant. The end of your prison tour. Hmm. Here is sort of place, isn't it? Oh, that depends on the viewpoint. Uh, you've worked in this prison a long time, haven't you, Keezy? Uh, I've been here 35 years, Mr. Grant. Really? Yes, sir. 35 years for the service. Yeah. Is this your regular job, taking visitors through the prison? Yes, I've been doing this for several years. But it's a poor substitute for the place that rightfully belongs to me. The place that rightfully belongs to you? What do you mean by that? Uh, nothing. Uh, nothing at all. I shouldn't even have mentioned it. Uh, come now, this has nothing to do with your tour of the prison. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't mean to pry into your affair. Oh, now, pay no attention to what I've said. I'm a bit out of sort today, nervous, I guess. Yes, I understand. I suppose I'd be nervous, too, if I did the things you've done. The things I've done, Mr. Grant? Uh, what do you mean by that? Oh, nothing, Keezy. I'm just thinking of how I'd be affected by 35 years spent in a place like this. That's all. It does play on a body's nerves. But a single visit can affect the nerves even more than 35 years. I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, not now, perhaps. But you will. I. Uh, you will. Well, it's been a very interesting tour, and I'm much obliged to you. I must be running along now. Uh, but I haven't explained this room, the death house, to you. Well, that's hardly necessary. Surely you wouldn't leave without sitting in the electric chair, Mr. Cranston. <laughs> My curiosity doesn't go to such extremes. But every visitor sits in the chair. Well, Keezy, you've been very thorough in showing me through the prison, so if you feel I'm spoiling your final touch, why, of course I'll sit in your chair. Ah, good. Uh, sit right down. Then. All right. There we are. Now I'll strap you in. Hmm. Oh, it won't take a minute. There. The chest straps are already, you see. Well, you certainly did that with amazing speed, Keezy. Like an expert. I am an expert, Mr. Cranston. Years ago, I was a member of the execution squad. Really? Then you participated in the actual executions? I was one of the men whose job it was to strap the condemned in the chair. Ah, there's a man for each strap, you know. Speed is important. The quicker it's done, the less the condemned suffers. I was on the chest strap. That happens to be the most important one. Well, I, I can testify to your efficiency. I, I can hardly move a muscle. I don't suppose you can. There we are. Snug as a bug in a rug. But not so comfortable. Uh, by the way, Mr. Cranston, uh, you remember the famous Carlton case, don't you? Oh, very well. Carlton was brought to justice as a result of the efforts of a character known... As the shadow. Uh, then surely you must remember me. My picture was in all the newspapers at the time. Oh, really? I suppose you helped to strap Cousin in the chair. Oh, no, no. I executed him. You what? Oh, it was a very unusual case. Uh, you see, we had a new executioner. At the last moment, the poor fellow's nerve gave away. Oh, there was quite a to-do. Carlton was already strapped in the chair. The warden was beside himself. Somebody had to bring matters to a conclusion. So, I volunteered my services. As executioner? Uh, yes. Oh, it was quite an experience. First and only time I ever attracted the least bit of attention. But it was the cause of the most bitter disappointment in my whole life. Disappointment? Uh, you see, I'd hoped that my service would be rewarded with a permanent appointment as executioner. You had an ambition to make a career of it? Oh, well, why not? Hundreds of others applied for the job. Oh, it's a position of distinction. Uh, you say you were promised the job? Yes, but the authorities didn't live up to the promise. They cheated me, robbed me of what was mine. Oh, I wouldn't let it disturb me so if I were you. Disturb me? It's rankled in my heart throughout the years and left me with one consuming desire to hate. Well, a hatred like that can hurt no one but yourself. You think not, and I know better. I'll make them pay for what they've done to me. I'll make them pay. I think you have an entirely wrong attitude, Kizzy. Well, this has all been very exciting, and now if you'll unstrap me and let me out of this electric chair, why... What? Let you out of the chair, Mr. Cranston? Never. I'm going to give you what I gave the others. What do you mean, Kizzy? In a moment, I'm going to pull the switch and fling you into eternity. Let me out of the chair. Yes, I'll let you out. You can't do anything like that. You can't get away with it. I told you I'll make them pay for what they've done to me. Get yourself together, man. Why do you want to wreck your vengeance on people like me? Because you are people, and the people cheated me, and they'll pay for it. Cheesy, you're a fiend. I'm a cheated man. That's only your excuse, an excuse you offer your conscience to justify the things you do. Shut up. There's only one reason for you doing a thing like this, Cheesy. The desire to satisfy a vicious urge in your diabolic nature. Shut up, I think. 
You can't go through with this thing without your excuse. Well, I'm going to take that away from you. I'm going to turn you inside out and show you the fiend you really are. I'll let you. I'll shut you up. I'll put the headpiece on and cover your face with a death. Don't you dare. Take it away, Fatini. You can say what you want now. I don't have to hear you. Now, the switch and eternity. <laughs> you out now, Mr. Cranston. I've killed him. He's dead. Hey, lady. Can't park here all day. You'll have to move along. I'm waiting for a friend, officer. Don't you know you're not allowed to park within 500 feet of a prison? But my friend should be along any minute now. Where is he? He's in the prison. He's a visitor. Visitor? Did you say he's a visitor? Yes. What's the matter, officer? Why do you stand there like that? Tell me what's the matter. Officer! Oh, Lamont. Oh, oh, Lamont. Can't figure out why people have their water pumps outside the house. Those are freeze. Oh, uh, here you are, Mr. Keezy. I uh, don't expect this water pump will give you any more trouble. This twice, not tonight. You've done a good job, Mort. Sorry I had to get you up on a night like this. Can't no pleasure plodding up that there sand road any night. <laughs> Say, what's the matter with that hound dog urine? Doing a powerful lot of howling tonight, ain't he? Yes, quite a lot. They say uh, hounds howl like that when somebody dies. Dies? Yes, yes, I've heard that said. Chimney pickets. It's enough to make a body's skin creep. Yeah. You don't suppose they see something, do you? A spirit, I mean? No, it's nothing. Forget it. Uh, don't reckon even spirits would come up here. Uh, does he... Does he often howl like that? I've only heard him do that twice before. Tonight makes the third time. Well, uh, there's your water pump. Fit and fine, Mr. Keezy. I'll be getting on down to home now. Good night to you. Good night, Mort. Right. Here. Tell ya. In the house. Where are you going? Eat. Enough of that now. Lie down. Chicken-hearted old hound. Just like a human. You fear death, too. That fool Mr. Cranston I sent to eternity today, he was afraid of death. But that didn't save him. He's no more. He's dead. And I'll send many of us after him. <laughs> what was that? Who's there? <laughs> Who's out there? Is that you, Mort? No, Keezy. Mort is well down the hill now. There's nobody out there. I'm right here, in your house. Right here in the room with you. I know where you are. You're in this pub. <laughs> Go away, go away. 
You're dead. You're dead. Confess, Keezy. I killed you. You're dead. Confess. I won't. I won't go away. Confess. Wait, wait. Confess. All right, all right. I killed him. I killed him. But I'll never be taken alive. Never. Never. Ah! understand how Keezy could have hidden his crimes for so long. It's quite understandable, Margot. Each of Keezy's victims seemed to have died from natural causes. But Lamont, I... Now, let me explain, Margot. You see, Keezy was somewhat of a student of the psychology of fear. And this knowledge and the victim's natural fear of a factual instrument of death, the electric chair, enabled Keezy to produce a fear paralysis that stopped the hearts of his victims. They died of heart failure. Then he didn't actually electrocute them? He couldn't, Margot. The electric chair is never hooked to the powerhouse, except during a legal execution. But you, Lamont, I I thought you were dead. Well, Margot, I produced a death condition by a little trick in self-hypnosis that I learned from an old Hindu. I let Keezy think he had actually killed me. But it's an amazing case, Lamont. I'm glad it's over. Yes, Margot, it's over. Keezy was a fiend consumed by the heat of his own hatred. He's now the many destroyed. And who knows, perhaps theirs is the final and most complete vengeance. Ha, 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 ha.